All right, folks. Uh, welcome to the week 13 Collaborate session. So uh, what we're going to be doing today is going over the uh, slides from the fairly short uh, lecture that we had this week. <clears throat> and we're going to be talking over uh, any questions anybody has about those slides, uh, about any of the uh, issues that are brought up here where we're talking about de developing an academic writing style. Okay. Uh, we'll do that, and then the rest of it will probably be a question and answer session. Uh, so any questions that you guys have uh, in regards to the class, uh, that's going to be a uh, fair game. So, uh, so go ahead and post those, all right? Uh, well, when we get to that point. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started here. So uh, we're talking developing an academic writing style. Now, rather than just a one-sided information dump, most academic essays act as one part of a conversation where disputed claims are investigated, evaluated, and debated. <clears throat> okay, so mainly what we're dealing with here is uh, you have to think about your writing in an academic setting as being part of a talk, okay, part of a discussion between uh, multiple people. Uh, you're going to be looking at each other's uh, – claims each other's invest, uh, investigative uh, tendencies and trying to evaluate who is right, who is wrong, uh, debating amongst yourselves. So in order to participate, though, both the writer and the audience need to be speaking the same language and have a clear conception of what the di different terminology being used to investigate the subject are. You, as a writer, are responsible for making sure this relationship is maintained in the work. So you're doing a little bit of heavy lifting here when it comes to uh, making sure that your audience is understanding what you have to say. <clears throat> One of the things that I wanted to illustrate this is the uh, excerpt from the sailing manual uh, that I put up on the uh, that I put up on the lecture. Okay, it's in the beginning of chapter 19. If you're looking in the ebook version or in the uh, unabridged print version, okay. <clears throat> this essay is about sailing. It has a great deal of specific terminology that, unless you're a sailor yourself or come from a sailing or a Navy family you might not be familiar with. The burden of explanation then rests on the author to ensure that his or her audience understands the specific terminology. Now, in this case, it doesn't really apply because the uh, work in question is explicitly aimed for sailors. Okay? Uh, the passage in question is from the Annapolis Book of Seamanship by uh, John Rosmanier. <clears throat> okay? Uh, in this case, it's the shift of the audience that causes the issue. Now we have an uninitiated audience who found this thing, and it wasn't written for them, so now we're, we're the ones who are confused and trying to figure out what's going on. Okay? So I'm not going to read this passage again because that's going to lose everybody here because I imagine there's not a lot of uh, people here who uh, have a lot of familiarity with uh, uh, running a square rigger uh, sailing ship. So we're just going to move on. To four key concepts, okay, four, feet, four key components to academic conversations which have to be kept in consideration as you write, okay? So one is the important concepts or ideas. Make sure your audience understands any specific concepts you're going to be using consistently or else they'll fall behind in reading the essay and be unable to keep up, okay? So here's some of the examples that Yelsky gives. Uh, biologists, for example, examine questions about living organisms and how they function. To address these questions, they rely on knowledge developed through research, and they draw on accepted theories, such as natural selection, to help them understand that research. Similarly, psychologists explore questions about how humans think and interact with each other, drawing on various kinds of studies and theories, such as behaviorism, to understand human cognition and social interactions. To write effectively in biology or psychology requires understanding the nature of the questions that scholars in those disciplines examine and becoming familiar with key concepts in those fields. In part, students gain this understanding simply by doing the assigned work in a course and learning the subject matter. But students are unlikely to be familiar with some of the less common concepts or ideas in academic fields if they encounter them in course readings of source material. Okay? For example, if you're reading a scholarly article in psychology, you might recognize refer references to behaviorism, but not to operant conditioning, which is an important concept in behaviorism. Without a basic understanding of operant conditioning, you might find it difficult to follow the discussion in the article. <clears throat> okay, so make sure 
the audience understands the concepts that you're dealing with, the ideas that are being presented, uh, if, especially if they're standard for the academic field. Next is specialized terminology. If there's jargon that's used in your field or within the subject matter you're discussing that is not in common use, it'll be up to you to define those terms in order to allow the audience to comprehend your ideas. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> that's one thing that Yelsky makes clear here is that uh, most professions have their own specific set of terms. Okay? Here's what he has to say. Like sailors, people in just about any profession or activity you can think of, engineers, lawyers, dancers, electricians, nurses, use a specialized language to do their work. Sometimes the specialized language is criticized as jargon, but it is essential to the work scholars do in their disciplines. Just as knowing specialized terms on a sailboat allows sailors to operate the boat safely and effectively, knowing the terminology in the academic field is often necessary for understanding scholarly tasks in that field and can strengthen your ability to write effectively about relevant topics in that field. Okay, so make sure that you have knowledge of what the terminology is for your field and that your audience has that same knowledge. Okay, uh, next we get the conventions. Uh, this gets heavily into phrasing and formatting. Specific fields have styles that have to be conformed to in order to be considered a professional and collegial work. Uh, this includes using style guides, the MLA guide, the APA guide, the Chicago style guide. They come in handy. Every field has a specific guide that's called for. Here's what Yagelsky has to say about it. Conventions are common practices such as how to introduce key ideas, when and how to cite sources, what is appropriate style, and how to organize a text. Some basic conventions are followed in most kinds of academic writing, but many academic disciplines have more specialized conventions that writers are expected to follow. For example, in many social science disciplines, such as psychology and economics, writers typically don't use direct quotations when citing a source. By contrast, in many fields in the humanities, such as history or English, direct quotations from sources are common and expected. In some disciplines, writers never use the first person, whereas in others, the use of first person is common. As a student who is learning new disciplines, it is essential for you to be aware that these different conventions exist and to become familiar enough with the basic conventions to be able to understand the reading and writing you are asked to do in your classes. Okay? So you need to know what's expected of you, uh, how you're expected to conduct yourself in the course of the writing, how you're expected to present the writing. Okay? <clears throat> and then we have assumptions about the audience. It's the fourth key component here. Typically, an academic writer runs on the assumption that their audience is experts and professionals in the field and adjusts their writing style accordingly. The idea of writing for the stupidest person in the room typically does not apply here, as all members of the audience are assumed to be at an equal level. Okay? So again, that advice I gave in early in the semester about writing for the stupidest person in the room, that, gener that applies mainly to general audiences, not to academic ones. Okay? Here's what Yelsky has to say about it. <clears throat> For example, anthropologists usually expect their readers to have an in-depth understanding of the complexities of culture and the established theories for understanding how cultures develop and affect our lives. So they don't have to explain established concepts or theories, and they can assume that if they refer to an important study or figure in the field, their readers will not only recognize the reference, but also understand the significance. As a newcomer to an academic field, you might not be a part of the intended audience for specialized scholarly writing which can make reading scholarly texts challenging. As a writer, part of your challenge is to determine what expectations you can reasonably make about your readers when it comes to the academic subject about what you're writing. For example, if you're writing an essay about ethical questions surrounding operant conditioning for a psychology class, you probably don't need to explain that concept because you can assume your audience, your professor and other students in the psychology course, are familiar with it. However, if you're writing the, for the, about the same topic for an introductory writing class, you will probably have to explain the concept and maybe even provide some history about it. Okay? So, uh, if you're writing within the field, don't worry about it. Your audience is going to know what the terms are. They're going to know what the, what the uh, phrases mean. Uh, if you are writing for general audience, uh, then you need to do some explanation. All right, so the next slide is talking about uh, is the uh, exercise for this week's lecture. Okay, uh, it's an excerpt from the article published in a psychology journal that Yagelsky provides in the first section of chapter 19. Uh, it is, uh, and my book is labeled as Exercise 7A. 
okay? Uh, in chapter 19, it should be the first uh, textbook exercise, okay? I read through the passage on the lecture, but there are four questions that you need to answer and post your answers to questions to the professor, okay? Uh, one of them is regards to key concepts or ideas that are discussed. Second is uh, specialized terms or language that are present in the passage, and whether you understand them or not. Uh, third, assumptions, what assumptions the authors are making about the audience. And the fourth is how well do you understand the passage and how much familiarity with the field of study uh, it's from do you have and does that inform your understanding of it? Okay. Uh, so uh, again, I'm not going to read through that passage. I already did in the lecture. To find it in the lecture. Okay. Uh, next thing we're talking about is developing an academic writing style yourself. Okay. Uh, Yelsky gives you three guidelines for developing your own academic style. First off, how you write affects what you write. The way you present your ideas goes further than just the ideas themselves in the academic setting. Your audience expects you to know how to summarize relevant information, how to quote properly, how to synthesize ideas from your sources, and write coherent paragraphs about complicated subjects. You're also expected to know how to fit your own work into the larger context. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Uh, here's what uh, Yigelsky has to say about it. In academic writing, that means adopting an appropriate style and presenting your ideas in a way that meets the expectations of your audience. Academic audiences expect writers to know how to summarize relevant information and other points of view, to quote properly from appropriate sources, to synthesize ideas clearly, to write coherent paragraphs about complicated subject matter, uh, to, and to place the arguments or analyses in the context of the larger academic subject within, within which they are writing. Okay? <clears throat> so... You kind of have to bring it all together and bring it to bear toward all of the academic style of writing, okay? Uh, second one might be a little confusing. It says good writing isn't necessarily always good writing, okay? Certain fields of study have expectations of writing style that fits within the discipline. Yagelsky's example is that a good history paper does not necessarily resonate as a good economics paper. This also goes along with fitting into a conversation. Your writing style must stay consistent with expectations in the field so that your ideals, ideas will be taken seriously and you will be understood to belong in that conversation. Okay? That's the big thing here you want to take away from this. Uh, you need to suit the writing for the field you're writing for. Okay? Uh, suit, suit it for the field that you're writing within. So don't try to uh, do the same thing that you do... Don't try to write, say, a science paper using the same uh, techniques that you use to write short stories and expect that paper to get very far, okay? Uh, third, practice may, might make perfect, but it also means making mistakes. Don't expect perfection right from the start, and don't punish yourself for making mistakes when you haven't written for an academic audience before. Practice means getting the kinks out of your writing style and learning from the mistakes that you make so that you avoid making them again, okay? Uh, don't worry about making mistakes. They're noted, you absorb the information, and then you move on, okay? That's the best approach to take to mistakes, whether they're, made, whether they're intentional or not, okay? Uh, so if you don't make mistakes, you never learn is basically what it comes down to, okay? <clears throat> Let's take a look at some academic inquiry basics, okay? Uh, these are some of the basic skills needed to succeed as an academic writer. First off, qualifying statements, okay? You have, you have to mean what you say, which means you can't generalize. You must use qualifying statements when writing academically, okay? Uh, so this is a variation of what the example Yagelsky has in here, okay? Uh, so, in casual conversation or informal writing, it's acceptable to say something like, drivers just don't pay attention to speed limits. Okay? So, you need, this is okay if you're in an informal setting and you're talking to friends, talking to family, whatever. Okay? Maybe you're just complaining. Okay? Whatever. Academic writing, though, values accuracy and validity. Okay? Such statements need, usually need to be qualified depending on the rhetorical context. Okay? He has three examples of this. First one, drivers often seem to ignore speed limits. OK? 
okay? That qualifies thing because now we're not saying uh, all drivers, okay? Now you're saying uh, it's not all drivers all the time. Now you're saying that it's, it's all drivers, but they very often tend to, okay? Uh, another option, many drivers ignore speed limits, okay? Now it's not all drivers. Uh, now it's not all drivers, but they uh, are now intentionally ignoring speed limits, okay? Uh, third one, studies show that most drivers sometimes exceed speed limits. That's the best qualification there because now you've qualified both statements, okay? Now you're saying that it's not all drivers and it's not always intentional, <clears throat> okay? So uh, the words that were changed in these uh, sentences to add to drivers just don't pay attention to speed limits, uh, those, are, those make the statements more true. Okay, if you can't support a statement with evidence, then qualify it so that it is valid. Okay, uh, you don't want to outright lie, but you can qualify things so that if you have some wiggle room there in case you're found to be incorrect. Okay. <clears throat> Second one: be specific and avoid vagaries. Uh, while statements without specifics can sound reasonable in spoken word conversations, they are the death knell for academic works. Statements like schools can improve if they change do not work in this setting. There has to be a specific proposal in that sentence. Okay? So again, that's a variant on the example Yelsky gives. Uh, in order for education to work, things need to change. That's a statement that Yelsky has. Such a statement seems reasonable enough, but it doesn't quite hold up under scrutiny. What does it mean to say that education must work? What things must change? And what kinds of changes are necessary? Often vague terms like things are a sign that a statement itself might be vague. Even if this statement appears in a longer paragraph explaining those things and changes, such a statement is weak by the common standards of academic writing. We might revise it as follows. Here's his rev revision here. If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education, both administrative and curricular reforms should be implemented. See, that's a bit more specific, okay? Notice that in this statement, the writer avoids vague terms and tries to be more specific about what it means for schools to work. Specificity isn't always possible or even desirable, but often vagueness can weaken your writing, okay? <clears throat> now, the next, uh, next one, give credit, okay? More than just citing sources properly, you need to use appropriate language, such as signal phrases, to indicate that the information is not something you have generated yourself. It also, it's also to make clear that another human being generated the information. Don't give credit to the article, give credit to the author. Okay? This is a common Okay? People uh, attribute things to the articles themselves as opposed to the authors who wrote the articles. <clears throat> And this basically has the effect of saying, oh, well, the article just appeared out of the ether, and it says this, so I must cite the article, and I must, I must give credit to the article. Never, never once giving credit to the author that actually wrote it, okay? Okay, so the examples uh, Yelsky gives. The article states that money spent on schools can do little to improve educational outcomes. Technically, there's nothing wrong with the sentence, but it is an awkward way of introducing information or referring to material taken from a source. For one thing, it isn't the article, but the author who makes the statement. That might seem to be a minor point, but minor revisions can make the sentence stronger by bringing it into line with the conventions of academic prose. The, the author claims that money spent on schools can do little to improve educational outcomes. Okay, that's one solution. According to this author, Money spent on schools can do little to improve educational outcomes. There's another possibility, okay? Both of these work very well. These revised versions make it clear that the assertion being made is attributed to the author of the source, not to the writer of this sentence. They also sound as though the writer is in better command of the source material, which conveys a sense of authority. So ultimately, by giving the proper credit, you actually sound smarter, okay? Keep that in mind. All right, and the uh, fourth one here, use specialized terminology, terminology judiciously, okay? Don't use excessive jargon wantonly to the point that your essay becomes far too wordy to read comfortably. 
Some students feel that tossing around big words makes them sound more intelligent. Many times, though, the opposite is true. Okay? Now, there was a really good example that I gave you from Yagelsky that's in the lecture. Okay? Uh, and that is this paragraph about uh, predicting academic achievement through socioeconomic inequality. Okay? Uh, there was a uh, big worded passage. And then there was an edited version where the big words were replaced with stuff that was very, uh, not, I want to say simple, but it's going to be a little bit more cohesive, coherent, okay? Uh, so pretty much here, the goal is not to use, such, use every $65 word in your vocabulary in your essays, okay? The goal here is to be understood. Uh, not to sound smart, but to actually be smart, okay? So you want to make sure that the ter the language you're using, terminology you're using, is something the audience is going to understand. It's not just there to give extra fluff or a pad of page count, a pad of word count, or whatever, okay? If you're using flowery language for the point of using flowery language, uh, that's not really uh, writing in an academic style. That is uh, writing in an annoying style. Okay. Uh, finally, last part of this uh, this week was active and passive voice. Okay. Uh, this is an element that uh, people forget about uh, when they talk about academic writing. You still have to use an active voice. Okay. Uh, many writing instructors will harp on the idea that active voice must be used most of the time and passive voice should be used sparingly. However, they won't tell you the reason why. Okay? To put it simply, uh, active voice versus passive voice is the difference in the emphasis that verbs give the subjects they discuss. Okay? It's a question of whether the subject is doing something or the subject is having something done to it. Okay? In active voice, the subject is taking direct action. It's doing something. So in these examples, the dog ran to the tree. The cat dug its claws into the bark and sped up the side, avoiding the drooling jaws. Okay? Uh, the example that uh, Yagelsky gives here. Okay? Uh, so we have, let's see. In the active voice, uh, this is a sentence he gives. If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from attaining a sound education, elected officials should undertake several reforms. Okay? So the uh, subject of that uh, sentence that's taking the direct ref several reforms, undertaking the reforms, is the elected officials. Okay? Uh, the emphasis now is on the subject of the uh, sentence. Uh, they're actually doing something. They're moving it forward. That's an active voice sentence now. Okay. However, in passive voice, the subject is having action done to it, usually with verbs in the be or was family. So be, is, was, okay? So if, to use my examples, the dog was running to the tree. The cat was climbing the tree. The cat was getting away from the dog. All three of those are passive voice. All three of those sentences make that sound exceedingly dull or like something that came out of a child's textbook, okay? Uh, for Yagelsky's example, remember the uh, active voice version of this. If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education, elected officials should undertake several reforms, okay? As active voice. When he switches it to passive voice, here's what it turns into. If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education, they should implement both administrative and curricular reforms. Okay? Now, the problem here is that now the uh, uh, emphasis has been shifted. Okay? Uh, it's now shifted to the need for school reform rather than who's actually going to do it. Okay? Again, we, the subject now has something having, do, having something done to it. In this case, the schools are having reforms undertaken on them. Whereas the other version of that sentence had the elected officials performing the reforms. So the sub, they, they were the emphasis of the sentence now, and they were the ones actually taking action. Okay? As opposed to the passive voice version of it where the school is the emphasis of the uh, sentence, and it's having something done to it. 
Okay. Active voice makes for a more interesting form of writing and makes your reader more interested in continuing to read. Readers are more willing to read about subjects that are performing actions rather than subjects having actions performed to them. Okay. That's not to say that you're never going to use passive voice. There are actually some academic fields that really call for it more than they call for active voice. Okay. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of determining whether you're in one of those fields and whether it's appropriate to do it that way. Okay. All right. So uh, that does it for the slides for this week. Uh, so we can go ahead and uh, if you want, we can get to, into some questions here. Uh, as I mentioned before, th there's not much to the slides this week and not a lot of extra stuff I can add to this. So uh, we can go ahead and open it up for questions here. Uh, anybody has any questions, go ahead and raise your hand uh, and I will uh, answer to the best of my ability. <clears throat>
All right, so since there doesn't seem to be any questions going on, uh, we do, I do want to go through some of the uh, uh, details involving uh, what's coming up due and uh, what you can expect for the next couple of weeks here, or for the next few weeks. <clears throat> All right, so uh, some of this is actually going to get repeated in next week's lecture. Uh, I will say that next week's lecture is a short one because it's basically just uh, housekeeping. Okay, but uh, here's what I want to go over with you guys. First off, uh, you have to, you have a number of uh, assignments that are coming up due on December 4th. Uh, that is two weeks from this Friday. Okay, uh, so we have the analysis synthesis essay. That's the main thing that's coming up due. Okay. Uh, next week is going to be the first workshop on that. That's the, re the revision workshop. Fol following week is the proofreading and editing workshop. And then on that Friday, it's due. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the other things are coming up due on the 4th. Uh, one of them is the weekly discussion boards. Now, you, go you guys are going to have uh, one more topic posted for that. Okay. Uh, it's going to be next week. Week 14 is going to be the last topic posted on the weekly discussion board. You have will have a full week without a new topic that you can use to catch up on that discussion board uh, before it locks on December 4th at midnight. Okay. After it locks, you will not be able to post to it again. Also keep in mind that A, your grade for the discussion board is uh, based on how many uh, posts you make, uh, basically ha how many of the threads you post to, okay, and post a full post to, okay. Sec B, a full post consists of three full paragraphs, okay. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're clear on this because I've been looking through the discussion boards, especially you get to the later discussion boards and people are having trouble adhering to this. Uh, let me just at random go pick one here. Okay, so let me uh, share my uh, tab. Okay. All right, so I'm sharing the tab. So again, this is... This is one of the discussion topics that's currently available. I have a two-paragraph response. Now, here's a three-paragraph. That's okay. Uh, three-paragraph. Uh, this one is a uh, file that I have to open up. Uh, this is a one-paragraph response with a huge open space. Uh, we have a one-sentence one response, okay? A one-paragraph, one okay? One paragraph, one paragraph, okay? All those one paragraph responses will not count, okay? So make sure that when you are posting your responses, you're posting the full three paragraphs, okay? So everybody needs, everybody needs to be aware of that. All right. I'm back here now. Okay, the... Uh, so, weekly discussion board locks on December 4th. Uh, your grade is going to be based on how many, how many of those topics you were able to post a full response to, a full three-paragraph response, okay? Uh, the other third thing that's coming up due on December 4th is MindTap, okay? Any material that you have not completed in MindTap yet needs to be done by that time, okay? Uh, so, you need to be working on that. You have, should have been working on that from the start of the semester. Uh, MindTap will lock just like the discussion board on December 4th at midnight. And whatever you've got done in there will determine what your grade is. Okay. So whatever score you have on MindTap, by the time it locks on December 4th, that's going to be your score uh, and how it counts towards your grade. All right. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the other uh, uh, the different assignments are also weighted differently uh, because of the weighting of the course, okay, the weighting of each assignment. Uh, let me get, bring up my syllabus. There it is. All right, so 
uh, the weight the weights of each assignment there. Uh, the uh, scholarship essay is worth 20 points. The uh, uh, blog project was worth 25 points. Or, excuse me, this is percentages, okay? So analysis essay, 20%. Uh, that's the scholarship. The uh, blog, uh, blog project, 25%. The analysis synthesis essay is 20%, okay? Then discussion board is 10%, then mind tap is 15%, okay? And the last element here is the final exam, which is 10%, okay? So the discussion board and the final exam have equal weight. They're both worth 10%. Likewise, the uh, scholarship essay is worth 20%, and the analysis synthesis essay is also worth 20%, okay? So... The only outliers here, the blog is 25%, MindTap is 15%. So you want to make sure that everything is being uh, properly taken care of so that you get the maximum on your grade. Let me just show this to you real quick so you can see I'm just not blowing smoke up your butt. Here's a summary of graded work, okay? So... Uh, Again, 20% for the scholarship essay, 25% for the blog, 20% for the analysis synthesis essay, 10% for the discussion board, 15% for mind tap, 10% for final exam. That equals 100%, okay? And here's the percentages you need for each, for each letter grade. All right. So we need to make sure we're doing all of that. Uh, one thing I'm going to outline for you next week is also an opportunity that you have for improving your grade if you're not happy with the grades that you got on the earlier assignments, okay? Uh, there's really only one that you can try to fix uh, to turn in for a better grade, and that is the uh, scholarship essay, okay? If you want to try to do a better grade on the scholarship essay to try to improve your grade, uh, I'm okay with that. The only thing is you have to have that in by December 4th. Okay, I will not take any retries any later than the 4th of December. Okay. Uh, now, as far as everything else goes, there will be a lecture next week. It'll kind of go into a little bit more detail about what I just talked about. Uh, there will be another lecture on the last week of the semester. That's the week of November 30th. Okay. Uh, as far as these collaborate sessions go, uh, take note of this. There will not be a collaborate session next week, okay? Uh, next week is the holiday week. I'm not going to make you guys come on just to hear me jabber, okay? So next week, there's no collaborate meeting. It is just going to be the lecture. Week following, we'll have the, lec the last lecture and the last collaborate meeting, Okay. And that last collaborate meeting is pretty much just going to be limited to a question and answer session. Okay. All right. So uh, don't so basically don't come don't look um, come looking for the room uh, next Wednesday because I am going to keep it locked. You're not going to be able to get to it. Okay. Not till the following week. All right. And then obviously the week after the week of November 30th, the following week is finals week. Okay, uh, we're going to talk over in the week 15 lecture uh, what the procedure is going to be for finals week. Okay, so uh, go ahead and open it up for one more round of questions here. Uh, and if nobody's got any questions, uh, you can go ahead and uh, take off. Uh, but if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand uh, and let me try to answer for you. Okay, Milagros, I see your hand there. What's your question? We can ask you whether we completed all our stuff on MindTap, because I'm just trying to see if I completed everything. Uh, let, me, let me bring up my gradebook, and I can let you know. Okay. 
Let's see. Because pretty, pretty much what the I'm, I'm trying to remember here what the great book looks like for me for my tap, but I think it's pretty much just gives me a total score and a percent, which is a percentage basically. So let me see. Great book. There we go. Let me find you here. Uh, Vasquez, okay. There we go. Okay. I'm looking at your lineup here, and it looks like you have completed everything. So you're good. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, there's one other thing I should let you guys know, and that is if you're looking at your percentages on BindTap, uh, that does not tell you how many assignments you've completed. That tells you the score you've gotten, uh, the cumulative score you have on everything you've completed thus far. Uh, anything that you have not completed yet, it does not include in that grade. Okay, so uh, when that... The fair warning here, when MindTap locks, anything you have not completed reverts to zero, okay? Uh, and that, and your grade will take a massive hit, all right? So make sure you've got, make sure you've got that done before you get, before uh, the class locks, okay? Uh, thankfully, there's, a, there's quite a good amount of people who have done uh, everything, okay? But there are still some people who are missing assignments. There's a couple people who've only only done one. I see uh, at least four or five people who have, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, who have their MindTap access and have not done a single assignment. Okay, so uh, you want to make sure that you guys are doing the assignments. Make sure you guys are doing them to the best of your ability, so that you can at least get some kind of grade. Because a zero, uh, fifteen percent of your grade being zero is going to be a huge hit. Okay. So do your do your best. Get as many much of it done as you can. Okay.
All right, let's see. Instructions for the synthesis essay. Okay. Um, I remember here, since it's in one of the lectures. Uh, let me just check my files here. You know what, there it is. Yeah, uh, you need to look at week 10, okay? Week 10 gives you the uh, instructions for that. All right. All right, if there's no other questions here, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, end this session. Uh, again, remember, there's no session next week. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, two weeks. In two weeks, we'll be doing the uh, final lectures and the final collaborate session. Uh, continue working on uh, your synthesis essays. Uh, remember that next week, you are doing the revision workshop on that. Okay, uh, so thanks for coming by, and uh, we'll see you guys for the lecture next week.